The door latch snapped gently behind as Marcus let himself in. Something he had done many times before. A tired copy of Earth Abides lay intentionally on the lobby side table. Hello, Marcus called. Enthusiastic, calming inclinations were murmured back. His old friend seemed more cheerful than usual. Despite the stonking cold he had had for some weeks, the voice bore a surprising felicity. Perhaps it was elation at Marcus's arrival. Having made his own cup of tea, Marcus walked through to Eli's spacious study, lined with books of every kind, many of them by his own hand. The life works of this eccentric microbiologist was re represented on every wall. Marcus slumped into the old leather chair in the corner. He was surveyed around by various tall and well-loved plants. Have you seen this? Marcus waved a newspaper that sat beside the chair. The last Bonobo died this week. Invariably, Eli already knew this. Isn't it terrible? Eli responded, croaky voiced. The same old stories. Farmers in need of land to feed their people. A poacher's desire to make a living. Never heard you take the side of the poachers before, Marcus responded through raised, bushy eyebrows. We've done so much. Mitigation and laws, technologies, protests. I've been thinking about my use of water just this week. And I don't think I've used plastic for anything in years. What more can we do? Marcus sunk back into the chair to read the paper. Oh, how was your trip? It sounded like you spent more time in airports than anywhere else. Eli stiffly stood up. Did you know I circumnavigated the globe? Dubai, Beijing, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and back here to London, he said impressively. Surprisingly polluting for you, I would have thought. Were the lectures and book signings worth the world? Marcus asked over the paper. Eli gently laughed through his thick chest. I think it's probably the last time I'll see those places. I thought I could allow myself one more adventure. Eli changed his tone. Now, how are your bees? I lost two hives this year, but the others are strong enough. They really showed the dog what for the other day. She could smell the mice beneath the boxes and disturb the bees. I must have found three dozen in her fur. She was lucky I was not the Crufts type, otherwise she might not have gotten out alive, Marcus offered. Three dozen brave bees gave their life for the greater good, Eli gave his friend his focus. Marcus responded without looking up from the paper. It's nothing to them, though. It's simple biological sense. If some die, but it means the hive survives, then it's an obvious choice. Walking over to the scotch, Eli poured himself a glass. Want one, he offered. It's 10.30 in the morning, man. What's the matter with you? Marcus looked up over his glasses. It's, let's call it medicinal, the old man grinned. Marcus... What do you think is in store for the future of humanity? I mean, with what we are doing to the world. Eli's tone was still light and cheerful despite his implicit morbid, morbid question. Marcus put down the paper and paused. He looked out at the large glass windows of the study. This climate is changing, there's no doubt about that. I think we try so much and it seems to come to nothing. For the first 20 years of this century, all the hard work to stop climate change seemed to have come to so very little. That carbon figure just kept rising regardless. A lot of it to do with those industrial nations like China and India. They have so many people and no one wants to curb their desire for wealth. And fair enough, I suppose. It's always easier to make the world's problems someone else's fault. If I'm being frank, I think there's just simply too many people. Too many people who need to eat and be clothed. I don't think the Bonobos will be the last ones. Marcus paused a while, and with notable change in his tone and elevation of the brow continued. Though I spoke to a chap that recently went back to visit his mother in Latvia. Beautiful country it is. There are just a quarter of a million people left there now, and he told me that the old villages near where he used to grow up had almost entirely returned to woodland again. The wilderness had reclaimed it. Eli smiled. Isn't that a beautiful phenomenon? The airy sight of trees growing through playgrounds. Marcus continued. 
I'm afraid many countries have not had the same experience, and to answer your question, I do not know what the future holds for us. Marcus had had similar conversations many times before, often over whiskey, though more often later in the day. Naturally, there just isn't a solution to it, he said. Eli probed further. Do you think this will be the end of life on this planet? You know from your own work, bacteria spread within Peachy Dish until their own effluence and self-destruction wipes them out entirely. That's probably what will happen to us, but we'll be taking the rest of the world with us. Eli stood pointedly in the quiet of the study and remarked, You know when we're finished, and we have indeed reduced our Petri Dish to an uninhabitable rock, that is most likely the end of all life in this universe. Have you ever considered that? Well, we can't know for certain, but it could be lo look like that, Marcus agreed. Eli's eyes lit up brightly with an excited flare his friend had not seen in many years. What if I told you I agreed with you entirely? But what if I told you I had a solution that would fix this mess, but it would come at a cost? Marcus carefully folded a paper and placed it on the table next to him. I think there are very few new ideas to this complex problem. And I know that there are no quick fixes or simple solutions. But, he hesitated, if such a thing existed, the cost would well be worth it. I would say, if it meant the survival of life as we know it, not least that of our own species, then at any cost, as they say. Good, I think I agree. Eli, through stiff joints, strode to a chiller box next to his desk. Inside he took out a vial, on which the label mostly obscured the contents. The clinical clean tube and chiller box stood in stark contrast to the historic study that surrounded them. Eli nursed it for a while and croaked. Did you know that after the plague of the 1300s had ravished Europe, a whole new world order emerged from the ruins? Those who were left found new standing. The poor suddenly could obtain homes. Workers could demand the pay that they would entitled. There was no more squabbling over scraps of land. The whole system was shaken, and those who worked rather than those in authority now had the power. It brought abundance, equality. It brought freedom. Eli held the vial up to the window. This is the sting in the tail. Just like your bees, Marcus. He offered the test tube up to the eyes of his friend, who leaned forward in the creaky chair to look closely. For most of my life, I've not been able to cl uh, come to any other conclusion to the simple question you answered earlier. If there is a cost to pay for humanity, perhaps all life on Earth, then we have no choice to pay it. He paused as Marcus looked through the glass of the container. It is fundamental truth that all of us will perish, and it will, st and it can be stopped by, and if it can be stopped by us doing something, then that is what we must do. What on earth are you talking about, Eli? Marcus asked sharply. He knew his friend was brilliant, and though he had always expected his madness, it was never a sinister one. The beauty of your bees is that by some dying in a manner that's well within their nature, their sisters can survive. And what is more, their species can survive. You said it yourself. Eli held the vial so that it glinted innocently in the sunlight. For the last eight years I've been working on this. My desire was to take the common rhinovirus and cause it to hyperstimulate the pituitary glands. The body gradually and exponentially produces its own natural endogenous opioids. This and a great deal else. It's a symphony in the body, poetically mimicking man's place in the natural world. These hormones produce an ever-brightening euphoria and serenity, and eventually this comes at the cost of eventually slowing the heart to a permanent rest. Marcus was shocked. His friend had been working on curing disease and looking to microbiology to save, solve our ails for his whole life, and now he was using it like some Bond villain. Are you telling me that you created a disease that will kill people? Marcus stood abruptly, an utter disbelief in his posture. In short, yes. If all the masses that are affected by this, this cure, would have died any way of starvation or extreme weather or the countless other ways we are killing ourselves as a species because of our inability to not do so, 
Shirley catching a sniffle, feeling a wonderful joy, then falling into a deep sleep, ne sleep never to know the demise, is immeasurably better. Feeling a wonderful joy, then falling into a deep sleep, never to know of your demise, is immeasurably better. The feeling is akin to how my father described the late 60s. Besides, no difficult political decisions need to be made, no unthinkable genocides or selections. This little glass will naturally save the future of our hive. My God, you've lost your mind! Anyone else would have had you locked up in an institution, but I fear you of all people may have just been capable of creating such a thing. You've declared yourself judge of life, self-appointed deity, an angel of death. I cannot allow it. It sounds like you've already decided on genocide. Marcus spat with venom. He felt a greater fear than uh, that this was no jest. He knew his friend had the skill to do such a thing. He had the facilities at the university where his renown meant his work in progress went unchecked. And most of all, he knew Eli's stubborn eccentricity would concoct such a plan through to fruition. So upon whom and where have you decided to release this? And what nation did you think deserved your wrath first? Marcus paced across the room. He could not face his friend who still stood up with such a nonchalance. Marcus continued with his back turned before his friend could respond. I won't allow you to do this, you know. You won't get away with it. It's not your fate to judge the human race. And there's an excellent tenacity to stop things like this. People like you. Give me that vial. Eli calmly walked over to his friend and genially handed it over the vial. His hand placed gently on Marcus's tense shoulder. Can you see any other way out of this mess we've brought on ourselves? Even if 99% of us end our days because of this virus, you can't argue that it's better than 100% of us. Marcus looked at the vial. Why then have you given it to me? I could destroy it here and now. Because, Marcus, it's already done. Eli smiled warmly to his friend, his eyes devoid of worry, but filled with a distant compassion. Marcus cast off his friend's approach. Eli coughed strenuously. You haven't, you fool! Marcus repulsed back from the old man. Eli looked into the, old of his, into the eyes of his dear old friend. I couldn't decide if I should start with the most polluting places, perhaps the nations furthest away from those that have worked hardest to save our world. What about those responsible, or the richest, or maybe choose at random? You are right though. I never felt qualified to be God or judge humanity, so I thought the most noble thing to do would be to start with me. I quite like the poetic justice of that. Marcus froze for a moment, then fumbled anxiously for a phone. I'm not going to let you get away with this. You're not going to leave this room. We're going to do something about this right here and now. Have you infected me also? Do I have it? Talk to me, man. Eli put his hand gently on the phone in Marcus's hand. I cannot tell you if you have it, old friend, but this has already happened. There's nothing you can do about it now. Even in relative frailty like my old body, it takes a few weeks to even be noticed. The virus has been resident in my body since last month, and only this last couple of weeks have I even noticed the first symptoms. Marcus looked in disbelief. He heard the audible sound of a terrifying realisation. Eli sipped his scotch familiarly. My publisher, who I'm never, I've never been very fond of, has had a somewhat unwitting part to play in all this saving of the world business. For on their bill, I have visited some of the most fascinating but certainly crowded places on Earth. Airports that take dreadful polluting aircraft and those going about their daily lives to every corner of the planet. I lament the good times we've had as a people. But there will be mourning, and I know that humanity will learn from its mistakes, and the world, not just our world, but the planet itself, will be so much better in the end. The woods will return, the fish, the birds. Humanity itself will be happier. It's for the best. Marcus slumped back down into the old leather chair, still a look of disbelief across his face, an emptiness in his eyes. I think I might have that scotch now. <laughs>